Now, Luke, I understand that you came in to visit us to talk about your attachment issues with your father. Yeah, probably. And how did that make you feel? Well, sad. And? And mad. And, uh, definitely not glad. Yes, yes, well, the absence of one's father can create terrible illusions of grandeur for children. And when that is taken away, a sense of attachment can grow to something you never knew. It's very difficult on the psyche. It's a good thing you came to therapy. Huh? Talk about how you missed your father. Oh. Oh, no, I didn't miss him. But you said... I came in here for my attachment issues, which my father called by cutting off my hand! And, uh, how did that make you feel? With the constant release of new Star Wars movies, the age-old question is, what's your favorite? What's your favorite Star Wars movie? And that's what I want this video to be, an answer to that question. I often find that one of the most difficult things that you can do is actually review the things that you genuinely really love. And I think that has less to do with our penchants for edginess or for critiquing all of our work and seeing things in a certain light and way more for wanting to articulate your beliefs and your interests really well. And when you love something so much, you just want to go on record saying how much you love it. And I think for Star Wars as a whole, that's applicable for me, but especially for Empire Strikes Back. So here it is, folks. My favorite Star Wars movie of all time. Let's do this. It's rare that you see sequels besting their prequels. I mean, Empire strikes a new hope out by a wide margin. Everything and anything about it is better and more grand and grandiose. And I'm not saying like a new hope being your favorite movie is necessarily the wrong thing, but it's just that Empire Strikes Back takes all the amazing things that a new hope did and does it better and it does it differently, which is something that a lot of sequels cannot say. And most sequels to great big movies at the time and now still flop big. And while we do get sequels that are good, but not necessarily better than the original, back then Empire Strikes Back not only was the thing that was better than the original, but it created the idea of a sequel being better than the original. And the most important part of this is upping the stakes by a large margin. Now you might be wondering to yourself, how? How can you up the margin from a planet killer, from something that just explodes planets out of the sky? What is a bigger threat? Well, nothing. And that's why they've reused it a time or two over the time of Star Wars' chronology. However, it's not about upping the metaphysical stakes, the huge, gigantic bad guy. It's not about good versus evil destroys this big bad thing because it becomes a little more complex than that. What Empire Strikes Back does that's so critical and so smart is that it ups the ante of emotional weight for the characters. It takes you along this path, this winding path of its main characters, and you really feel like you're at the ground level with them. And you go with them and you figure out what this means to them. And this journey just goes in on them. And it's introspective in a lot of ways. You know, it doesn't run away from its quiet moments. A great deal of the movie takes place on Dagobah while Luke is being trained and learning the sword, even though he never actually learns how to fight with a lightsaber. Anyway, he does have gumption though. And we learn more about the force because A New Hope left you with so many questions. It left you with, what is the force? How does it work? Who is Darth Vader? Why is Darth Vader? <laughs> And who's leading this galactic empire? Amongst many, 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 many other questions. I mean, you have to imagine being in 1977 and walking out of Star Wars and just being like, what just happened? That was amazing, but what just happened? What is all of this stuff? But people didn't necessarily ask those questions because a sequel wasn't guaranteed yet. But when a sequel was guaranteed, they knew that they had to go in and they had to explain some stuff. And learning about the mythology and your characters and the war itself, in a lot of ways, 
that is what makes a movie great and that's what makes a sequel better than the original because it adds so much weight to what the original was i mean like i said a lot of it is spe is spent with luke learning the force and the audience is simultaneously learning what that is too and then we have Leia and Han and their sizzling romantic tension on the Falcon, and that's in quiet, deep space. I mean, sure, you're interrupted by asteroid fields and by the puppet coming out of the asteroid. You know, there's there's beats, there's action, action beats. This is a space fantasy action movie. Let's stop kidding ourselves and stop calling it science fiction. But this is what makes Star Wars great, when we see these moments that it break up the big action scenes because honestly like it's less about flair this movie and much more about why these characters matter to us in the beginning of empire strikes back we kind of get the similar vibes of a new hope like the battle was won but the war is still continuing and the battle of hoth is this epic huge fight and it does give you a taste for that epic group battle that we got in the end of A New Hope and it's a necessary fight to see and it's one of the most technologically impressive because filming in the snow and all white is almost impossible to disguise camera equipment and George Lucas was like it's harder but we're gonna do it and that's really really innovative for the time but immediately after that we get this romantic tension between Han and Leia and it just sort of snowballs and creates this big effect in this tension. Han has to go back. He has to leave because of his deal with Jabba the Hutt and Leia is mad about it and lashing out and won't admit that she has romantic feelings for him and that frustrates him because there's you get the impression that between the years of this movie there's been a sort of a back and forth between the two of them and it makes sense because of what we see at the end of A New Hope. And you know, you're kind of left wondering, and mind you, this is the authentic Star Wars experience, is it going to be Luke or is it going to be Han that ends up with Leia? And this movie answers that question. Are you stuck up, half-witted, scruffy-looking nerf herder? You kind of dodged a sister-sized bullet there, but... And amongst all the answers it gives us, it doesn't deliver it on a platter by any means. We're still left with a lot of questions. I mean, the whole question of the Force is still going on. We'll use the Force. That's not how the Force works. Instead, we feel like we are experiencing this journey and learning these answers just as much as the characters are. We're learning where Leia's romantic affections lie, and it's pretty obvious. We're learning about the Force, we're learning about the Jedi through Yoda, and we're learning about Darth Vader being Luke's father, of course. Spoiler alert, in case you didn't know. <laughs> they go on go this journey, and they split up. The gang does split up, but it allows for more intimate moments, and it allows for less crowding on the Millennium Falcon. Because while it's like really important to have these exciting lightsaber fights that are definitely grander than the last, or learning about the living force and seeing how it works, it's just as important to have these quiet moments between these characters, because that is what we fall in love with. Luke doesn't enter the battle against Darth Vader because he just wants to show off. Instead, he enters it because he wants to save his friends. The end of the movie isn't driven by the war like it was last time. Instead, it's driven because they want to save their friend, because Han is essentially kidnapped, and that sets up the next movie. And Empire leaves you with this uncertain but hopeful feeling that you're like, wow, they didn't win. They didn't win. I mean, Luke lost his duel with Vader. He lost more than just the duel. And we learn that, you know, so Luke isn't in it for the glory. Leia isn't is actually showing emotional vulnerability for the first time in her life. And Han, Han said he wasn't in it for a lot of things. Look, I ain't in this for your revolution, and I'm not in it for you, princess. But he is. And that's why the stakes feel so much higher in this one. Don't get me wrong, I love the action adventure scenes. I love the scene versus the AT-ATs. I love playing that in every video game that's ever existed about the Empire Strikes Back. I adore the lightsaber battle. When I was little and I saw A New Hope, I was so pissed. I felt cheated about lightsaber battles because I had had an impression previously. But imagine seeing this for the first time and never having anything like this exist before. But what makes Empire Strikes Back so important is the characters that we follow. It's much more character centric than the last one. And it's much less about the stakes of the whole galaxy and more about the stakes of our fab characters. Empire does a lot different, as I mentioned previously. 
It cultivates a galaxy that's both diverse and interesting without throwing it all in one place. And don't get me wrong, I love the thousands of cantina-like scenes that we've had over Star Wars. However, it's nice seeing them interspersed throughout the galaxy because we kind of take a road trip with Han and Leia for an undisclosed amount of time. We actually have no idea how much time passes while Luke is on Dagobah and Han and Leia are in space. It's like, is it a few months? Is it a few weeks? Along the way, you know, we see Hoth, and Hoth is unlike anything we'd seen before. It's this huge, gross snow planet, and we see the Tauntauns and the Wampas, and then we move on to Dagobah, and Dagobah has about every gross creature under the sun, including a very cute little puppet man, who I love so, so, so much. And you see like the swamp planet and all the agriculture there and that's impressive and then we go to cloud city which is beautiful and it takes place in the actual clouds on bespin and that's impressive in and of itself and then we get this crater scene before this where this big puppet monster comes out and that's cool too so you know we get a lot of along the way and it feels very naturally implemented and I think one of the things that Empire does better than the other Star Wars movies is that. And that doesn't mean that this movie takes any less time to explore new characters too. You know, we meet Lando and Yoda and the Emperor and then there's Boba Fett that people wish mattered more. It has no problem introducing and throwing new things into it all the while developing our old tried and true characters. And we don't sacrifice Obi-Wan Kenobi for Yoda. We learn of this concept of a force ghost and it's absolutely maddening. And while A New Hope gets the, definitely gets the cultural credit for starting all of this and it gets a boost for being the very first movie in the franchise, Empire Strikes Back makes it better as I'd said like 50 times before. But on a cultural level, Empire Strikes Back is what fanned the flames of the Star Wars boom. You know, like if it sucked, it would have just been another franchise stuck in the mud with two movies. But this it was the one that gave everybody hope that good sequels could be made. And from then it was like rapid fire. We've gotten a lot of movies because of Empire Strikes Back, some better than others. And I'll say that with confidence. It changes cinematic history forever. I mean, Luke, I am your father, despite being misquoted, became not only a plot twist in so many other mediums, it was teased and parodied all the time. It it totally erased trust in movie watching in a sense, because now every Star Wars movie we watch, we're like, she has brown hair. Is that Ray's mom? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> He's black. Finn? Finn, is that your grandpa? And it doesn't make any sense. Whereas Vader, you know, there was no basis of fact beforehand other than the fact, yeah, he uses the force and we don't know how old he is because he wears black all the time. He's edgy and emo. But the whole parentage plot twist answers two big questions. Who's Luke's Jedi father and who is Darth Vader? That's what I call two birds, one stone, my friends. And it shocked everyone. They filmed so many different cuts of it that I think only James Earl Jones and George Lucas really knew one of the possibilities. Like even Mark Hamill was reacting to something different when they filmed that. That's how severe this was, and that's how serious George Lucas knew this was going to be. Because Star Wars was such a big boom, and he's like, I gotta up the ante. We gotta throw something else in there that's going to totally change the course of everything, as well as the battle, and it totally makes the war different. You know, before Luke just had to kind of go up against the bad guy, and he was taking his friends and hurting his friends, but now it's his father, and Luke has a lot of attachment issues, as I, as I suggested earlier. And... We think, oh no, that could be dangerous. It's definitely something I wish I had experienced for myself as a kid. I was totally spoiled for it far before I watched Star Wars. And, you know, it was still a big deal. And it still is a big deal. And I think with a plot twist like that, it being a big deal and making a lot of sense, is a good thing, even after the surprise of it is kind of taken out from under you. And aside from the Luke, I am your father misquoted scene, we have a lot of more epic moments in Empire Strikes Back. I love you, I know is such a big deal because it highlights the best of these characters so much. Leia, who won't show emotional vulnerability up until this point, realizes that she has to do it now. It's now or never because Han may die. And so she just says, her, she speaks her heart. And it's the first time we see that from a princess that had to watch her planet explode in front of her and lie in the face of danger at the age of 19. So now here she is given this moment where she just has to let him know. She has to tell him. And Han 
The thing is, everyone misinterprets this I know as some sly, cocky thing that he just says to piss her off. But the reality of it is, is that he knows. And that's such a big deal because Leia probably was struggling with this like, crap, I never told him I loved him. And him saying I know is a big deal because it's like, I know, it's gonna be okay. Maybe. <laughs> but you don't have to feel guilty for this and what's going on. This is not your fault and I've known all along, so you don't need to feel guilty for keeping yourself closed up to me, because I get you. And that's why it's a big deal, folks. Han Solo is not some playboy cat. He is a softie who has a penchant for short brunettes. And we're introduced to Yoda, as I said. Yoda is one of the biggest symbols in all of Star Wars, next to Vader, C-3PO slash R2-D2, Princess Leia's buns, and lightsabers themselves. So, you know, He's a big deal, and I don't know why they decided to stray away from this puppet Yoda version, but that's, that's, that's what we get later. My favorite Yoda quote is, do or do not, there is no try. Because it directly contradicts Revenge of the Sith. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. Unless it's a hint. But so much happens in this movie that I swear a different part grabs at me different times. So this is it. This is my favorite Star Wars movie of all time, no questions asked. That is the best movie to me, Empire Strikes Back. And I think for good reason too. Obviously everyone has different opinions and different reasons for the things that they love, but this is mine. I wish I could talk more in depth about it, but honestly this video would be hours and hours long and not even some semblance of constructive reasoning. And honestly, in doing so, I need a hand. Yeah. May the force be with you, and you guys have a great day. Yeah. Yeah.